Hello everybody, welcome to yet another Social Blueprint interview. Friends, the Jewish people are the ultimate story of hope. That's right, we have been persecuted for a few thousand years, we are a tiny population, not especially well loved, but yet here we are. And I come back to that word hope, because hope is also part of addiction and addiction recovery. And that's why I'm so, so, so excited to be joined today by Ben Morley, because Ben is not only the ultimate story of hope and recovery, but also taking it a step further towards helping people, which again is a huge, huge Jewish trait. Ben, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I love coming on. I love speaking to the community and having the opportunity of actually reaching out and hopefully um, the, the viewers can be educated and have some more deeper understanding um, regarding addiction as a disease and what it can do. Yes. And Ben, you're not just talking from a higher place. You've lived it yourself. Sure. I do have lived experience. I was in the cycle of addiction for nearly 16 years. Um, 16. 16 years. My drug of choice or no choice uh, was cocaine and methamphetamine and I couldn't stop using on a daily basis and I ended up going into treatment for nearly nine months and coming out the other side and now I'm an interventionist, I'm an addiction specialist, I'm a recovery coach and I help uh, not just members of the Jewish community or families um, but communities as a whole throughout Melbourne. Right. Hey Ben, if we could just back up for a second sure. and I'll, I'll get to exactly why. How did you start out? Obviously you didn't just wake up as an addict, if you will. No. Well, I, yeah, look, you know, I come from a very um, a happy, loving, affluent family. I had everything given to me. I was a scopus boy. I was an actor. I was a performer. I loved the stage. I loved people uh, and had a really close-knit family growing up. Like right. I said, I had everything given to me. Um, but, you know, earlier on, I didn't, it wasn't on the cards for me to actually become a drug addict. That's not what I wanted to do. That wasn't my story that I thought would happen to me. I didn't put my hand up in high school and say, I want to be an addict when I'm older. Yes. Um, but eventually over a period of time, I started to experiment. I guess marijuana was my gateway drug. Right. And throughout that, I started to you know use occasionally or recreationally um, on an ongoing basis throughout my year 10, 11, 12. Um, I then went away. I did. I did a gap year. Right. I went on Aviv, an Israeli program, with okay. a lot of my friends. Uh, and eventually, over a period of time, I ended up doing a diploma of education and became a drama teacher at Yavna College for nearly nine years. Uh, and I love that. I love being right. around people. And like I said, in particularly in addiction circles or recovery, right. we're not bad people turning good. We're sick people getting well. Right. And that's what a lot of people um, I like to educate upon around addiction as a disease model. Yes. Yeah. So I didn't just fall into it. I all of a sudden realized after a period of time that it was the disease of more. I couldn't stop using drugs and alcohol on the a daily basis. The disease of more. The disease of more. I always needed a little bit more. I needed some more. It was never enough. Right. Yeah. So eventually after a period of time, I stopped using recreationally and going to parties and all of that over the weekends and enjoying it with my friends on a weekend. But I was isolated. I was on my own. I was resentful. I had guilt and shame. And I ended up just using on my own in an apartment. I was nearly 30. I was maybe 39 kilos just before I went into treatment. Wow. And I was stuck in the cycle of addiction and I couldn't break out of it. Yeah. And then can you, was there a point where you recognized you went from that recreational stage to where you actually had an issue. And again, I'm really trying to identify mm -hmm. because so many of us have friends that are either casual users of any type of drug, including yep. alcohol, by the way. Mm -hmm. But was there a point where you noticed, hey, listen, I've got a problem? Sure, I knew, I knew after a period of time, I was teaching uh, at Yavna College and I was using on a daily basis and I was, near, I was just locking myself in the car of my garage in a, in a drug-induced psychosis, scared of facing the world. And this, and I was, wow. you know, twenty five years old, and this was a kid who had so much love to give, and had so much love at home, and was loving acting, and loving being on stage, and being around people. That all of a sudden, this disease of addiction right. had me, and I was bereft of any hope or any life. I was just existing. However, I couldn't break out of that cycle. I couldn't do it on my own. As much as I wanted to stop, as much as I knew I had a problem, the drugs were all empowering, and. Right. Um, I was powerless over my addiction, which ironically is actually step one of a 12 step program. Is that acknowledgement that you felt powerless? Yes, that I'm powerless and my life has become unmanageable and I'm powerless over my addiction. Right. 
Okay, and also there, there's a statement I heard in doing some research, you mm -hmm. know, uh, not so much why, why the addiction, but also they say like, why the pain? Mm -hmm. And I, I, I attribute it to this uh, fellow, uh, Dr. Gabor Ramadan. Dr. Yeah. Yes. Was there any pain point looking back now that you were mm -hmm. trying to solve, do you think? Yeah, I guess there was an escape. I mean, there are many reasons why people drink or use drugs. Some can do it recreationally, some can't. Um, but for me, it was just the figure of that I needed that escape. I need. I wanted that serotonin dopamine release. I wanted to feel good. And that chemical imbalance that I had, I right. needed to just get that next time or that next fix. And I would do whatever it took in order just to get my drug. I, I didn't care. And I put my parents through hundreds of sleepless nights. I had sheriffs sure. coming to my front door, to, to my parents' house in the middle of the night saying they've seen Ben Morley banging his head against traffic light poles on St Kilda Road. I had drug dealers going to my dad's office. I had people looking for me. I had the whole community talking, my friends, my family members, many interventions. However, right. my, my parents enabled me for a long period of time. They had good intentions. They just wanted the best for me. And I guess like we were talking about earlier, yeah. the, the biggest challenge that I have in working with family members uh, of those who are struggling is actually giving them the hard support that may necessarily they not want to hear. Right. Okay, we're going to jump around a little sure. bit. Uh, you just mentioned enabling mm -hmm. and parents, and we're getting right into the weeds, everybody, about, uh, I guess, how to help people, because that's ultimately what we're trying to do. Yeah. We spoke about it offline. Yeah. Every parent is trying to help their kid. They only have the best of intentions, but a lot of times uh, that is actually the path to help. Yeah. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about what do you see are common mistakes, especially financially, that parents make, mm -hmm. especially parents that have means to help their children? Yep. Yeah. So I think there needs to be some non-negotiables with parents, with their loved ones. And we can talk from a 17-year-old to a 50-year-old, really. Uh, maybe just for a, a place to start, mm -hmm. let's just call it early 20s, late teens. Yes. Yeah. So it's really like to have some solid boundaries and some non-negotiables. And the parents or the uncles or the aunties need to work in a cohesive structure. So everyone needs to be on board and have the same non-negotiables and the same rules. Because otherwise the addict, the alcoholic, the 20 year old that may just be harm minimizing or using recreationally, I'm sure, like I said earlier, there can right. be 80% of things that are going on under the surface that family members are not privy to. So it's really important to maintain some boundaries and actually talk and open up to your kids. Right. to actually have these healthy conversations. Because I know when I was at school, we never had someone with lived experience or a recovering addict come in and actually explain to us or educate us right. around addiction, around drugs and alcohol, around having solid boundaries, which is really important. And to actually understand that it's okay to not be okay sometimes. Um, because, sure, that's life. That's life. And what I've found is, like I said earlier, the opposite of addiction is actually connection. It's actually connecting with other like-minded individuals. Right. So, so I believe any type of support is great. You can go see a psychologist or a psychiatrist or a counsellor every couple of weeks, and that can be great uh, to unpack any other issues that are going on. But in the meantime, there needs to be some type of support sure. around the child or the loved one that actually needs help and needs guidance. Right. So you're saying us as parents, and uh, I'm a parent certainly with yep. my wife, I... Uh, you're going to have to make some very hard decisions. Is that what you're saying? Where mm -hmm. the child, in other words, instead of giving them money that's for quote unquote rent, they yep. end up using it for drugs or something like that. You must unfortunately cut them off. Sure. And unfortunately, as they get older, they become more manipulative and more deceitful, like exactly really? like I was. And I could, I could manipulate my way to get whatever funds or cash that I needed off my parents to eventually the point where... I used to just carry dog biscuits in my pocket at midnight and break into their home so the dog wouldn't bark and go and steal their money or their valuables just to get my next hit. But that wasn't Ben Morley. That was the disease of addiction yes. overcoming me. That wasn't me at that time. And I know there are, there are thousands of people, even in our community, that struggle to understand the concept of addiction as a disease issue. And people can have their own opinions and their own thoughts around that. Um, but, you know, if I have diabetes or I have uh, any type of disease or if I break my leg, I go into the hospital, I get an operation, I get plaster, I right. then go home and I'm then in recovery. It's exactly the same as sure. addiction. If you go into treatment or you get 24-7 coaching or you go into a rehab or whatever that looks like, 90 days is really the time it takes to change the way you think and feel. So we're actually trying 90 to, days. 90 days. Uh, and I've worked with some clients from 90 days to 180 days up to 12 months. It's really about repetition. It's about changing the way they think and feel. It's about doing something on an ongoing basis in order to become the best versions of themselves they can be.
Okay, so maybe that's a good place to stop. Mm. Like you're in this state, and again, you know, I'm trying to get the story to yeah. help people. Of you were using the drugs for many, many years. Mm -hmm. um, rock bottom, that expression, if yeah. you will. And I know that you, you said that there was, a, I believe, a time when you were in the backseat of your father's car or something of that yeah. degree where you were at quote unquote rock bottom. Mm -hmm. I have no doubt you had many rock bottoms. Yes. Was there a way to identify, was this truly the bottom for you? Well, unfortunately, a lot of people adapt to their next rock bottom after they've hit one because everything has to be taken away from them. So there needs to be consequences. There needs to be ramifications for their decisions. Otherwise, they're not going to learn and they're not going to create new behaviours in order to do that. And sometimes we have to stop worrying about how the person feels and think more about what they need, not what they want. Because we can have the best in intentions. And they may hate you, they may just despise you, they, they may resent you for those first couple of weeks in order sure. to save their life. So we're not worrying about hurting someone's feelings in order to get them into the best support possible. So I was at a, 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 a rock bottom, uh, I was 35 years old, right. I was injecting cocaine and methamphetamine, I was on the floor of my apartment, um, 39 kilos, I was, real, I was suicidal, I, I was just existing in life. Uh, all the walls have started to close in. My friends, my family members who went through all the interventions and all the ongoing support to wonder how to save my life. Sure. Eventually, my brother-in-law, Diego, um, okay. who's married to Chloe, he wanted the Israeli way to just throw me in a room, lock the door, and chuck food and water under the door for a couple of months. That's the sort of hardcore Israeli military way to get clean. Just lock him in a room. But it sounds like you're actually, as, as crazy as that is, it yeah. sounds like, to some degree, you're not necessarily opposed to that. Well, I needed some hard support. I needed someone to actually <laughs> break the cycle and stop me. I was my own worst enemy because I was right. killing myself slowly. Yes. Uh, but eventually, I was taken in the back of my dad's car. I was put into a 12-step therapeutic community uh, rehab called the Raymond Hader Clinic in Geelong. Okay. I was driven out there on May the 31st, 2015. Um, I was in there for 97 days up in Geelong. We took all the, all the externals away, the TV, the phone, the iPads, the internet... Uh, everything was really? taken away and I was left on my own, well, with 29 other recovering addicts uh, in a solid 12-step program. And all of a sudden, I had to look internally. I had to look within. I had to learn how to sit with myself. I, I detoxed for a number of weeks on diazepam reduction. Uh, and I then started going to meetings. I started looking into myself. I did daily check-ins. I went for morning walks. I went to gym. It was more about repetition. Right. Uh, and after 97 days, I then went into a transition house in Mooney Ponds for another six months. Uh, so I was in treatment for a long time. Right. And it was really important for me because, and this is what I, I tell the friends and family that I work with and the family members for support, is I needed that first year of recovery to get my life back, to get Ben, Mor ben Morley back. Right. Who was I? What type of person was I? All I knew was myself was being stuck in a cycle of addiction for nearly 15 years. Sure. Uh, so at nine months clean, I did my AOD course. I did my alcohol and other drug. I got my Cert 4. I then started running a rehab with a very close colleague of mine. I, I was just so excited. I embraced recovery. I was so excited to take a year off life. Right. And just as a bit of a side note, sure. really important not to go back to work straight away, not to just get clean really quickly. All right, I've done my 30 days. I've gone to a detox for a couple of weeks. I've gone into treatment for 30 right. days. Thanks for having me. I need to make money. I'm going to go back out there. Right. I'm going to work because I need to be a good dad or I need to be a good son. I want to make amends to everyone and say right. sorry. That doesn't work. I've seen really? it happen so many times. To have that nine months or that 12 months off everyday life that most humans go through, to have that opportunity to be able to be in recovery and work on myself with a 24-7 coach for that first 12-month period actually got the rest of my life back. Wow. And I was really excited about that. So from that, yeah. I got my 12 months clean. I got really excited to get clean. I did NA meetings. I wrote gratitude lists. I worked through the 12 steps. I got a coach. I got a sponsor. I got a service position. I studied addiction. I thought, if I'm not going to take drugs and alcohol, right. I'm going to do the complete opposite. I started speaking at schools at 18 months clean. At two years clean, I met my wife, Paula Morley, who okay. also maintains total sobriety just to support me, which is unbelievable. She came in for a job one day. I fell in love straight away. We got okay. engaged. We got married. We had kids. Um, I've got three beautiful children, which wow. are my, my recovery babies. They're the reasons for my living. I, I was never meant to be a dad. I, 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 was never, I was meant to be dead in a ditch from, al yeah. from alcohol and drug addiction. Um, it's crazy. Yeah. But really important that I've been really, you know, we talk about Narcotics Anonymous and we talk about anonymity, 
But for me, for my, my from my experience, I needed to be vocal. Right. I needed to try to be a beacon or, or a, a spokesman or someone that can actually not sweep this under the rug in the Jewish community and not right. step on eggshells around different people, but to actually be honest and open. And like I said earlier, yeah. to empower addicts and alcoholics to actually be proud of being in recovery and be proud about being a recovering addict alcoholic. Right, take it and, and take the path. Okay, so if I can just ask, mm. the first thing is, and I think that there are a lot of people in any type of addiction, we're going to get into that also, that first period of time, the first 90 days, if you first will, but even the first seven days, if you will, so important. Can, can seem brutally hard to break that cycle. Yes. What was that like for you? It was hell. I was lying in a bed in the dark on my own in this rehab, alone with my thoughts, detoxing, sweating. I've lost so much. So, so, I was half the body weight. You're not exactly a, well, you're well, a, a master master now. I try my best. Um, and lying there with really healthy guilt and healthy shame. Look what I put my parents through. Look what I put my friends through. Mind you, I have five or six best friends, my Scopus boys, my brothers that I went right. through my whole life with that came and visited me at the rehab. They've always been by my side. I had friends that tried to hold my money for me. I was negotiating. I had many interventions when my 12 best friends would walk through many different apartments that I was living in that sat me down. I was always pointing the finger at them. Oh, but you've used with me and you don't understand right. and you're not an addict. I was really good at blaming other people. Why did I blame others? <laughs> <laughs> and remember, like I said earlier, I can be a master manipulator. I was a performer as well. Right. So I was really okay. good. And See, the just, perfect, uh, the perfect, the perfect. So I was really good at wearing a mask and trying to be this different person to all these different people. Right. You know, um, but that first week or that first 14 days or 30 days was pivotal to actually getting the rest of my life back. Did you think at any point in the first, as I said, in the first call, it's just called 10 days. Yeah. I can't handle this. This is just too much for me. I need a fix now. Yeah, definitely. I, 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 was, I was detoxing. It was really hard for me because when you put that drug back, when you stop using drugs and alcohol and all of a sudden you're trying to maintain total sobriety, your serotonin and dopamine levels go way down. Okay. And my ability to make conscious choices, my, my uh, frontal cortex, my neuro pathways, everything is just rebuilding. So my body had to restore itself back to factory settings. I was starting again. So being depressed, being sad, being angry, being anxious... I no longer had my best friend, which was my drug, right. which I used seven days, seven nights. All of a sudden, you take something away from someone that they've been using ongoing daily sure. for years. That can be really scary. That can Abs be That's why I'm asking. Yeah. Exactly. So it was hell for that period of time. However, like I say so much, it's about being around like-minded people. All of a sudden... I was with 29 other recovering addicts. Okay. The staff were in recovery. The the counsellors, the the tr transition workers, the owner of the rehab were all all had lived experience. Were all okay. recovering addicts. So everyone knew exactly your situation. And all of a sudden, I was sitting there at nine o'clock every morning at a check in with 29 other lost souls. Right. Um, being able to share my thoughts, my feelings, what I was going through, how it was being stuck in that cycle of addiction. Right. Interesting. Really powerful. Yeah, because as I said, like I, I can only imagine that beginning period must have been just unbelievably brutal. Uh, brutal. Uh, I, I didn't think I would, I would survive it. I didn't think I'd last it. And, uh, you know, I, I heard people sharing at meetings and getting their 30-day tags and their 90-day tags. Right. And some people were sharing that they're two years clean, five years clean. I was like, oh, wow. all at the same time, at the same place. Yes, we, okay. we would go to the nightly meetings. Okay. So we did 90 meetings in 90 days. Mind you, I'm an advocate for NA and the Fellowship of Narcotics Anonymous and Alcoholics Anonymous and whatever can help someone. But primarily, it's about one addict helping another and it's having 24-7 coaching support that you can have someone in your corner that's not your family member, that doesn't have a bias, that's not a counsellor or psychologist, someone that can relate through lived experience of what that person has gone through. Right. And you said it, you know, you mentioned it earlier, connection. Connection. That's what you needed. Pivotal. I, I needed that connection. I needed someone to understand my experience. And, you know, I, I'm garden variety drug addict, and we say this quite a bit. Um, wh mean? Whether you smoke marijuana or you inject heroin, a drug, a drug is a drug. So okay. it's the same for us. So that's why total sobriety, uh, which needs to happen. You know, someone can try to harm minimize. Someone with an addiction or alcoholism who goes into treatment for 30 days and thinks they can go back out there and test fate or go back right. out on the front line and see how they could go if they can manage themselves great if they can go through that great but from my experience as a interventionist and recovery coach i've had dozens of family members come back after three months six months 12 months 
saying they'll be okay, they're going into 30-day treatment, they're going to see a psychologist right. every month, come back and say, Ben, you were right, what can we do? What do we need to do to help our loved one? Yeah, and in broad strokes, would you have any idea, like, from a percentage point of view, of how many people that just say, you know, 30 days on, go out, back to it, would that, like, I guess, relapse rate be 50%? Yeah. yeah. Uh, definitely can be can be okay. even higher than that. Oh, okay. But I take my look in terms of the statistics. Anyone can just get, broadly, speaking. yeah. Anyone can get clean. Anyone can recover. Unfortunately, only about one percent of humans find recovery or find rehab. And from that one percent, one percent actually get clean and stay clean for over a year. So it's really a small minority of people that actually. That's why I'm, I have wow. such a, I have such an attitude of gratitude because most humans don't have the opportunity to find recovery. Most people don't have the opportunity to get 24-7 coaching or to have that opportunity to actually get their life back. So that's why when I take a family on board, I'm very, I think my wife says I have a bit of ADHD, which is a gift. She was, she was right. telling me, which is great. So I'm very, <laughs> I can see that uh, when I'm committed to someone and yes. I do something and I'm 24-7 support, it's really important that those family members understand this is an opportunity that needs to happen because the alternative, which we say in the rooms is jails, institutions or death. That's where addiction and alcoholism ends up. Jail I've seen many institutions people, or death? Yes. I've had many no, people die all OD. All three are not nice. And I've had many people OD in front of me. I've had people go through Alfred Road psych wards. I've had many people uh, go into prison and come out and be bailed to a rehab that I was running and actually realise the desperation that they need. And people aren't going to get clean for their kids or their wives who have left them or for their family members or their job. It has to come from within. And it has to come through desperation and a want and a need to work on themselves. And the only way that happens is through hard support from the family members. Okay, so that, and that brings me to one of my questions, which was, ultimately, does it have to come from, from yourself? As in, the person needs to say, I just have to do this. Help me, teach me, show me a new way to live. I'm willing to do whatever it takes. Okay. Mind you, if they have the opportunity and they're forced or the family members hold a line and hold a boundary and actually have some non-negotiables and say, if you don't do this, we can no longer engage with you and right. be part of your lifestyle and your choices. If you choose to continue to use or drink, uh, we can no longer engage with you. So this is- Make the, the penalty hard. Yes, because I didn't have that for a long time. I still had my parents there. I still had my sister there. Right. My friends were there time to time. I was really easy at gaslighting and blame game and playing the poor me card and what right. was me, which my mum fell straight into. Yeah, because we have that drama triangle that is set up so often that I see in family members as the persecutor, as the enabler, and as the victim. Yes. The, the addict stuck in the ditch. But for me, it's more so right. not... It's not my fault, so to speak. Yes, but it's more so not, you know, why or how did the donkey get in the ditch? Let's just get him out of the ditch. Yeah, so right. I don't care so much... What happened? Why did he do it? How dare he? Ben, what, what has he done? He's awful. Look what he's doing. To, uh, that's okay. Leave him or them or her with me. Right. I need to work um, congruently with them. Uh, and every, all the family members need to be on board and just understand and trust the process of recovery. Because I didn't just get clean to lead a mediocre life. I didn't just get clean to go back to work and do the daily grind right. and go on and live a life of mediocrity. Right. If I'm not going to take drugs and alcohol, I'm going to lead a life more than anything I thought possible. And here I sit seven years, five months clean, and I live a life beyond my wildest dreams. And does that come back to hope, you know, which I opened with, that is hope in your mind a absolutely essential piece of the puzzle? I think it can happen. It needs to be, it needs that people need to understand and have hope that they can recover. Like, did you still have hope even in your darkest hours, do you think? I, I always knew I had this drive and ambition inside of me that I wanted to achieve and I wanted to be someone. And I was a struggling actor for many years. Okay. Maybe it was a bit of delusional thinking when I became a drama teacher and resided to the fact I auditioned for nine to seven times. I tried performing arts. I tried to get on the big screen. And maybe that was something where I wanted to be loved and I wanted to be liked and I wanted to be seen and I wanted to be heard. But I knew deep down that I had this drive and this, this vision. I didn't really necessarily know what it was, but... Uh, over a period of time, when I was when I was, well, I was at my rock bottom, right, I, I knew that there was something there for me. I just didn't know how to get there. But as soon as I walked into treatment, as soon as I had coaching, as soon as I put my hand up and, and was resigned to the fact that I was bereft of any hope or life, I needed something. I needed help. Yes. But I was powerless, 
As soon as I went to treatment, after a week or two, I asked the rehab manager, I wanted to run the rehab. Wow, I wanted to okay. do the roster. I wanted to speak at every meeting. I, I was really immersed in, in, in recovery. So, okay, so that's a great, so tell us about what is it, you say you provide services. Can you just tell us a little bit about your program? Sure, so I'm a recovery coach and interventionist. So I do 24 seven support to family members as well as the addicts or the alcoholics that need help. I also speak at schools all around Australia. So I work with teenagers to 50, 60 year old alcoholics, addicts. Uh, so primarily my goal is to empower the loved one or the addict or alcoholic that, that still suffers to help get them clean, right. to help them get the best support that they can get. Um, I do WhatsApp groups separately to the family members. I do, I do daily 24 seven support with the loved ones that take me on. Uh, I work in two month and three month blocks. Right. Uh, and the first point, which I often say on Jair on my radio show, is uh, the first step is to actually reach out and give me a call or send me an email. Right. Because if you're pondering, if you're wondering, is my wife, is my son, is my friend okay? I don't really know, I'm not sure. They, they're probably not. Interesting. So when in doubt, there's kind of no doubt. Yes, because it, you're actually doing the best thing in helping them save their life. Uh, because people often say, you know, it's, it's a real struggle. I, I don't know. I'm scared. Sure. People can get really scared. I was scary at certain times. As a manipulator, as much as I was a loving, caring person, once you put a drug in me, I'm a completely different human. Wow. You know? So I, I would be really good at... Um, manipulating my family members and my friends and family to go against each other. I would often staff shop and split up family members so they would be, they would be part of the drama and part of the chaos. Wow. Uh, and, you know, I have so many family members uh, ring me every week. Ben, we need your help. Ben, what can we do? This is happening. The wife has left him. My son's in trouble. Uh, I'm not letting him come home. He's in the back room. We're paying for his rent. What should we be doing or not doing? You cannot give an alcohol addict cash. You cannot give them money as, what, as whatever their best intentions are. Right. Uh, you can help them. You can get some food for them. You can do whatever you need to do for them in order as to. As in do food, as in physical food. Or feed them and explain right. to them, build a rapport with them. But that's primarily my aim is in the first month, in the first month to build a rapport and gain the trust of the loved one. Right. So I'm not a family member. I'm not a best friend. I'm not their mate. I'm not their dad. I'm not their brother. Right. I'm not their psychiatrist. I'm a recovery coach. Right, who's okay. here to listen, who's here to empower, who's here to give them hard support, who's here to help them with their family members who are already in complete disbelief, resentful, angry, frustrated. Yes. Um, but to be educated around what their loved one is going through. So many family members that call me, parents, they don't understand the cycle of addiction. They don't understand addiction as a disease. They think their loved one is doing that on purpose. They feel threatened. They feel lesser than. They feel that... Um, they're not being heard. Right. And that's primarily my aim. I see. Because so, so many people, and what would you say, and I guess this is like a brass tactic, are afraid to confront their mate, their best friend and say, but I think you've got an issue. Yes. What do you say? And let's be honest, if, if you confront them, it sounds like you may get a confrontation. Yep. And that's okay. <laughs> that's okay, okay as well. Because you're doing it from a loving, caring space. And it's how you word it and how you confront them and how you put it to them. Are, right. you, are you their best friend? If you hear something, like we're not so, we shouldn't be worried so much so anymore about what, like what people do think and say is out of my control. All I can control are my attitudes and my actions. Right. Yeah? So if they're your best friend, if they're your partner, if they're your sister or your brother, don't be worried about hurting their feelings in order to save their life. So you can do it from a loving, caring way. And if they're in denial, if they don't want to hear it, if they yes. don't want a bar of it. Which I'm sure you've been on the other side of that. Sure. Well, they, at least they'll know and they'll go to bed at night time thinking, you know what? My best friend came to me today. They put it in my head. They've planted a seed. But I now know that if there's a problem, if I need help, I can feel comfortable enough to them to actually go back to them at any stage to know, you know what? I need help. Or let me call Ben. Or I'm willing to work through this. Because often than not... People can be embarrassed and ashamed and guilt-ridden of confronting it with their family members. I see. And even if that, you must be willing, and this is t to everybody, to yeah. sit there and say, you may go to sleep saying, that guy Greg was just such a jerk. I cannot believe he said it to me. That's okay. Just yeah. Because I think their own truth, they know if they have a problem. They know if they need help. Okay. And I knew going to bed at night time with my meth pipe and my, you know, all of my drugs around me, I knew that I had a problem. I just wasn't, no one, no one just wants so to So if your dad said to you, but you, uh, you've got a problem, buddy, mm -hmm. and you told him, dad, screw off. Yep. 
You're saying that's okay. Well, the, I, he kept doing that for a long period oh, of time, yeah, eventually. Okay. But he would actually then still give me money for rent and right. still help me with my legal fees and still help me with my petrol. And my mum would still come and drop food and groceries off at my door with some money every fortnight because they were just scared. They didn't want me to die. They, sure. they were worried. They were concerned. But they didn't know the right tools to use uh, as parents of a loved one who needs help. And hear this out, money is not the tool you're saying to just no, give money, them hard cash. No, of course not. Okay. It's actually, like I said, it is about connection. Um, and primarily it's about now I have, you know, the relationships that I have now are healthy relationships. Okay. And if people are worried about, about price and financial restrictions in terms of getting their son, well, what are they going to do in the meantime from what they're spending on drugs and alcohol? And I was always so worried. I have to pay my parents back and spend all this money. So many rehabs sent me all over Australia. I'm so guilty. I'm shameful. They didn't want, it wasn't necessarily about making a financial amends or paying them back. It was about staying in recovery. That's my amends to my parents to I'm actually sure. do that for them. Yes. You know, and now I'm just grateful that they're alive while I'm alive. I'm just grateful that I'm at, that I'm able to be the son, the, the brother, the nephew, the father that right. I can actually be because I was on borrowed time for a long time. Wow. Now, Ben, <clears throat> how do you run a business like this where, l let's face it, there are so thou hundreds of thousands of people that yeah. need assistance. And somebody's going to be watching this and somebody's going to contact you, mm -hmm. but you only have 24 hours a day, in a day. How, how do you prioritize? Uh, well, look, tough question. It's a tough question. I will always answer the phone. I will always answer my messages on my online, on my Instagram, on my Facebook. I will talk to anyone always that calls me up right. or listens to Jaya, which I'm right. on every Tuesday, 6 p.m. We'll link to it every uh, For Road to Recovery. Um, and... Like I said, whoever needs help or wants a question, it's always complete confidentiality. Right. Feel free to call me where, where no one else knows anything. Uh, I'm happy to give some advice and support. Um, and I always will give the opportunity for that loved one or the mother or the brother or the sister to sit down with me. We do an initial consultation. So, and it's so, it's, you know, it's the same tape plays every week of the same family member that tells me the same thing of so many similarities and so many similar behaviors. I actually have to sit and listen and be mindful um, because it's so it's the exact same story. But it's their first time, even, if it's, your, first even time. if it's your 100th yes. time. Right, right. And I don't like to call it intervention when I sit down with everybody. It's more about a gathering of loved ones to actually help their loved ones to get help and to get clean. Interesting. You know? um, and it's not just about... Anyone can just get clean. Anyone can just stop drugs and alcohol. But it's actually about staying clean and staying stopped. You know, that's the biggest challenge. And that's one of my, you know, big questions is that we've all been on, and I'll get to a broader addiction. Say mm -hmm. you go on a diet, you lose four kilograms and you yep. feel great. But you know, in your heart of hearts, you cannot maintain sustain it. Yeah. You cannot sustain it. Are there any tactics or how did you know? Because I assume you've tried over those, that 15 years or so. Yep. I assume that you tried here and there to get clean. Sure, every day I wanted to get clean. Okay, so you've been crazy here. <laughs> but I just couldn't or I wasn't ready or I was powerless over my addiction or I didn't have the tools or I didn't have... People can get very complacent. And this okay. is what I see so often. That's and, what I want to get to. And, yeah. and I've had so many success stories and like I'm, I've been like a, a nephew to so many new families that I've helped over time and I've helped their loved ones get clean and stay clean. Uh, unfortunately, the, the biggest hurdle can be complacency. Yes. And people actually saying, yeah, thanks for having me. I've got my 90 days clean. We're three months clean. The family members, thanks, Ben. We've got all the tools. You've helped us. You're taught, you've taught us. We're going to just trust him now. But how is the loved one or the addict alcoholic now going to be holding himself accountable? And that's about repetition. Okay. It's about doing the daily recovery things that need to happen. And unfortunately, I've seen so many people come through the fellowship of NA and AA get clean for periods of times, go back out there, relapse, come back with their towel between their legs, hopeless, thinking that their life's over, and then starting again. So it's really important to have repetition right. and to the, to the daily suggested things that we talk about in recovery. So every day? Every day. So for me, I did nearly 500 NA meetings in my first year. Yeah, I worked through the 12 steps, it took me about 18 months. I did my daily gratitude list. I went to meetings every right. day. Now, NA, AA, is part of my life, but it's not my life. Yeah, I've incorporated it into my life. So my day, my nightly meetings. Right. So in my first 12 months, I was doing a meeting every night for 12 months. Right, because we had 500 in a year. Well, yeah, and I was doing lunchtime exactly. meetings, okay, weekend yeah. meetings. Now, I do my, my home group every Monday night, which is the Monday NA, Narcotics Anonymous meeting. Okay. I do Wednesday nights. 
I do occasionally Friday nights, but I've incorporated NA in my recovery into my lifestyle. I see. If that okay. makes sense. So just like going to the gym three times a week or whatever it is. Sure. It is similar. But yes, repetition. but like I said early on, primarily for the first 12 months, it's about the person or the loved one and the family members saying, you know what, Ben, teach me, help me, show me. We will do whatever it takes because like I said, jails, institutions or death. Do you want to do the suggested things? Do you want right. to take on my support? Because I know what works and this is what your loved one and you right. need to do in order for your loved one to get clean and stay clean. I understand. Now, one of those areas is environment. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then there was like, I, I personally see where people say, you know, you need to change your environment. If there are people, if you have friends that are big users, you have to stay away yeah. from them. What do you do in situations though, where it's not so simple to change your environment, whether it's, Say it's especially family members that are actually yeah. somewhat destructive to your sure. journey. So nothing changes if nothing changes. <laughs> yeah, if that makes sense. So a lot of the times I go through treatment, I do three months, six months, nine months, 12 months clean. My family members are still pretty much the same people. Right. They haven't really changed. Yes, they've been educated a bit, a bit around recovery and addiction as a disease and the cycle of addiction. But I have to change myself and my relationships with my family members. So it's really about the person finding some internal change. Now, I didn't go into a licensed venue in my first 12 months. I still didn't drive down certain streets in Caulfield where drug wow. dealers used to live for okay. my first 12 months. Now, I'll go to a Bucks night of my friends for an hour or two. I'll go to a wedding for an hour or two. I won't put myself in a situation where there may be a 3% chance that there is a case of a possible relapse. Okay. Yeah. So primarily in the first year, I wouldn't have alcohol around a family member at a Shabbat. I wouldn't let them go to a wedding unsupervised. I wouldn't let them go to the races or somewhere where there may be alcohol, may be alcohol fueled. Just uh, or at night time, somewhere after midnight. A trigger. A trigger or a, a craving may pop up. Um, but in saying that, it's very important to actually have some non-negotiables and have a stringent set program for that first 12 months. Okay. Yeah? Delete all, all un unnecessary WhatsApp groups or, uh, you know, drug WhatsApp names or things that people do or old bad eggs, old friends, old using friends, people that don't influence positivity in their recovery. So would you say to a friend, because this is a great example, as you yeah. mentioned, you have friends in, I assume you're 10, you're 11, yeah. you know, close friends that probably are, are and maybe still are casual users of drugs. Sure. You don't want to obviously per se crimp their life yeah. style, but it's not helping you in that point. How do you handle people like that? That was a really big challenge for me oh, wow. in my first two years to actually be around my friends or not get invited or not go out after the footy on a Friday night or not go to a poker night on a Saturday night because I know they'd be doing drugs or alcohol or doing their thing and I didn't want to be that person that would stop them from doing that okay. or making it uncomfortable. So it was a real fine line between I know they want what's best for me but also that bit of mofo missing out on being around my friends and family. Now I'll go to lunches with my friends I'll go to the football with them. I'll go out with them. I'll spend time with them. Right. But, and you know, there's that 3% of me that sometimes wishes or wonders or misses it. Yes. I can love cocaine or right. drugs or alcohol, but I have an allergic reaction to it. Right. I cannot harm um, minimize. I'm not going to put myself in a situation I where see. if I have one drink or one line or one joint or, or whatever it is, uh, I'm not going to put myself in that situation where if I do that, I will lose everything and I may die. Right. So I'm not going to put myself That's in a this terrible situation. risk reward. Sure. Right. But what I've achieved in that in in the rest of my life is so empowering that I, it's it's unbelievable what I've managed to accomplish, and I wouldn't give anything back which I have. Okay. That. But my true friends, my my brothers that have stood by me through so many That's interventions what I and know. rehabs, um, they know me, and I have an amazing relationship with them, and they know my my boundaries, and we can often laugh and reflect. Right on the, what we used to go through. And I was, I was insane. The Thailand, the, the Israeli prison for a few days, from crazy thing, falling off motorbike in Thailand, ambulances, jails, things that happened around the world where I always thought, why did all this drama and all this chaos always happen to me? And I realized because I was a drug addict for a long time. Wow, and I okay. always invited all of that. But some of the stories and the crazy things that I actually often need to ask my, one of my best friends, Noah, to remind me of what happened. Because you have no recollection? A, a lot of the times. but And as a, as a quick segue, it's really important for me to be grounded and to remember where I've come from. Because seven and a half years later, what I went through in those last rock bottom months, weeks, yes. leading up to that, 
It's really important in my brain to remember how I felt and what I went through when I was desperate and hopeless and stuck in that cycle of suicide thoughts and unable to live and exist to have that desperation today of what I need to do. And that's the power of NA and going to meetings and sharing right. my story and going to schools and going to synagogues and speaking on Jair and speaking here and publicly actually explaining my story and my truth right. as one addict helping a lover, help, helping a lover, <laughs> yeah. helping another, because it is giving back. Right. Yeah. So if someone watches this, if someone has the idea, well, can I do it? Is there hope? No one really understands. Well, yes, there is a way out and people can recover. Okay. So that hope, it keeps coming back to that hope. Mm. Um, but I'm curious, you know, we, this is a, some you know, a, a Jewish show, but it is a, mm. a show for everybody. I, uh, to what degree does Judaism play a role in recovery as far as hope, higher power, or if, if at all? I, I, mean, yep. okay. I really believe it does from my own personal experience. I was loved back to life. I have a village of loved here. The, the, the community, my parents, friends, my uncles, my aunties, my cousin, um, you know, it was really people that I was sitting in Yom Kippur in Shaw and St. Shaw next to my dad the <laughs> other week, sitting there standing next to a lot of smelly men who hadn't showered for a while, <laughs> uh, fasting. And my truth was for nearly over a decade, I was sitting there high on drugs, sitting there sweating, just wanting to leave, just wanting to kill myself, just wanting to get home and keep using drugs, Sit standing there on Yom Kippur in complete disarray and such guilt and shame of what I was doing to my father standing next to me, who, who went through everything with me just to try to help his son. Right. But I, I, I'm now free from that, from that disease of addiction. I have a sense of purpose and I have freedom. I'm not, I'm not enslaved in the disease anymore. Okay. So addiction, it's not just about drugs. There are all kinds of addictions. And you mentioned how addiction is so isolating and it's the antithesis of connection. Yep. What do you say to people that, forget drugs for a second, they're addicted to food, whatever the addiction yeah. is, it's something that they don't want to share with people, but they know they've got a problem. Mm -hmm. Any way to break it to help them? Well, you know, we say that the addict alone is the addict in trouble. So the only way to do that is to find someone with lived experience or go online or speak to someone about it or try to find some type of uh, human connection that okay. actually understands that you can open up to right. because we can be our own worst enemy. And I tried to convince myself for months and years, alone in my apartment, on the floor, injecting drugs, thinking that I had the solution. Really? Where, where I didn't, obviously. Right. Uh, but it's more about breaking that cycle and actually changing your belief systems and actually realizing that your opinion isn't always right. And it's okay to actually put your hand up and say, you know what, I need help. Yeah. Yeah. And what type of human do they want to be? What type of son or father or wife or auntie? You know, what, what's, our, what's our motivation? What's our contention? What's our way to actually help someone change? Okay. Yeah. So what can you do to help your loved one who is currently suffering or has an issue or has a problem? And that's about making that first step and picking up the phone and reaching out and trying to get help. And would you also say that most people that if they think they've got an issue... They, do they probably do, yeah. I, I mean, that's and, and not to, everybody, but... Sure, and to get rid of that guilt and shame and that, that, um, um, that, that thought that someone thinks that it's, they're not good enough or they right. don't deserve it or they, they have a problem and they feel less than or they're going to be judged or tall poppy syndrome or that everyone's going to Keeping talk up badly. Keeping Yeah, 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 well. yeah. Because otherwise they're just going to spiral and it's, it's, it's a progressive illness, any type of addiction. It ends up in jails, institutions, or death. That's what happens. And all of a sudden, that father or that wife or that, that daughter is alone in their thoughts, in their back room, right. um, bereft of any life and just existing. You know, it reminds me of that line where they say you laugh together, but you cry alone or something of that nature. Yeah, yeah. And it, like I said, it's about daily connection and it's about repetition. Okay. It's about doing daily, the daily repetitive things in order to get your life back. And we do recover and people, and I've seen the light come on in people's eyes. I've seen people actually physically change in front of my eyes by working with them. And also the, the family members, my parents can go to sleep now at night time. Right. And, and the most frustrating part of what I do and the family members, you know, I've got mothers that still need to give their son who's an addict or alcoholic money every Monday to, to, and firmly believe that they're paying for their rent or right. they're paying I'm for sure. their medication or they're paying for whatever because they cannot detach and actually take a step back and think, you know what, I need support as a family member because I don't know what the best thing to do to my son or my loved one. And unfortunately, family members 
can be part of the problem. Yes, I, I could certainly understand that. As I said, you know, yeah. especially when they're honestly trying to help. Yes. And like the, they absolutely believe they Sure. Do. And the flip side of that is that I've also educated family members and parents and single mums and aunties and uncles that have actually changed the dynamics between themselves and their loved one. And their loved one has had coaching for a period of months or gone into treatment or rehab right. and they've worked on themselves and it's a, it's a new family. Yeah, it's amazing. So Ben, again, you know, going back to the Jewish team, you have really been through hell, but do you feel like at some level maybe that was Hashem's will? I, I have to say that I do. I'm, I'm a bit of a spiritual person. I'm not really a yoga meditative person because I'm so go, 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 which my wife challenges me on a daily basis. Um, but yeah, that, that Jewish connection, there was something inside, there was something eternal, there was something that I did have a close connection to Hashem or my... I didn't really listen in Hebrew class at high school. I was always the late son in the back of the class trying to get attention. But my Jewish connection is a huge part of okay. my recovery. And I'm so blessed that I've had so many people both in the Jewish news, at Jewish day schools, um, people like yourselves, people in the Jewish community yeah. who need to have a, who want this to have a voice, who need this to be heard. And um, I, I really hope to reach out and hope that more Jewish day schools, and I've, I've worked with many uh, mother, uh, mothers of parents, uh, parents, on the board of kids at Jewish day schools trying to help uh, the situation of addiction and myself get in there more so and be on the front line and actually explain and educate that our generations of the future because our kids at, at schools are the future and what yes. type of lessons, what type of resources, uh, what type of spokesmen and role models do we want to be for them to be able to move through this and you know even in this day and age yeah. there, are, there are year seven, year eight kids selling prescription drugs to grade fives and sixes, that's what's happening. You know, speaking of the schools, but how do we as parents, and we know, we struggle with this ourselves, mm -hmm. navigate between the, it, it's very easy to just say, just don't do anything. Yeah. But that's also harder to implement many times. Mm -hmm. How do you draw out those healthy boundaries of have fun, but, yeah. if you will? So you need to gain that trust. They need to feel comfortable enough with you guys as parents that they can actually open up to you and you can actually right. have healthy conversations with your son or with your loved one. Even for me, at 21, 25, when I started using drugs and alcohol, my conversations with my dad were either about Essendon, Ajax, uh, and that was, or cricket. Right. Pretty much it. Yeah. Um, so I guess he, he was too scared to open up to me about that. I didn't feel like I could connect with him about that. And all of a right. sudden, I'm alone with my thoughts, not being able to talk about drugs or my addiction or my disease, right. and I would just get further entrenched in, in the cycle. So would you... If you have a child in year 10, year 9, whatever that may yeah. be, have that conversation. Mm -hmm. You want to know what's going on. Even if it's quote-unquote against the rules, you still want to know about it then. Sure, say. yeah. Or, or gain that trust and rapport to actually start the conversation. So they're not going to tell you anything and everything that's ever yeah. happening in their life. But that they don't have to come home at 4 in the morning through the back door, scared about waking up and you finding out where they are or where right. they've been. That there's a bit more truth to the conversation and to actually let them know if they need extra help, like there right. is help out there okay. and they can actually pick up the phone and connect to either myself or a psychologist or whatever they feel um, they can connect to, to another human, which is important. It's, like I said, human connection. Yeah, it, it's incredible, you know, the, just the power of connection. And also, I, I, I suppose that whatever your issue is, there somebody else has had that issue. Yes, definitely. And, you know, then there's mental illness and mental health on top of addiction, uh, which can be really challenging. People who take medication for whatever type of right. depression or mental illness or whatever they're going through, and then to use drugs and alcohol on top of that, it's like pouring water onto a computer. All of a sudden, your loved one or your son or your daughter is actually um, doing more harm to their brain and, and their evolving minds right. going through an early process of high school or university right so your child falls they break their arm they're on some opioids for a few weeks and before you know it yeah it's all of really... a sudden and like we say in recovery our, our addiction you know does push-ups in the back of our mind waiting you know wait, ready to pounce <laughs> that's what happens because i could justify using drugs when i was feeling bad or feeling down or depressed or sad or um you know in my own in my own head but i could also justify when things were going really well and I was doing well, really well at uni and I was going to Yavna and teaching drama and getting awards and being a really good teacher. Right. You know, I was teaching hundreds of kids and I would come home with so much love and support and I, would, uh, be, I was their favourite teacher and I would come home sure. and just a drug addict on his own in an apartment injecting drugs. 
That was my truth. That was my purpose. That's what I lived through. So, you know, there were many years where I didn't know there was a way out and I didn't know that there was a way that people actually did recover. Wow. But you have and you're here and... I, I am. So just to finally, okay. like my dad likes to think, well done, Ben, you're seven years clean, you've recovered, you're cured. Uh, so we're never really cured. I'm right. always in recovery. Right. I, I never like... You're still to, doing push-ups. <laughs> still doing push-ups, still working on myself. And like I said... In America, nearly every second person has a coach or a mentor or right. someone that they can relate to or someone they can connect to. Yes. So I think slowly now, specifically in Australia and hopefully in the Jewish community, to actually have some 24-7 support, to have a recovery coach or a life coach or a mentor or whatever that is, is becoming more and more common. It's not very taboo and people don't judge it or feel like... I think. I wish some of my family members worked on themselves a bit more. <laughs> I, I wish that some of my friends had some extra support. And, you know, lately over the last year or two, I've had so many friends of mine or people that I never thought would actually reach out, pick up the phone and call me and say, wow. Dan, I actually need your help. Which for me is, is the reason why I do this. It's the reason why I give back is to actually help someone that actually wants to be helped and, or needs it. Yeah, and, and I, I, wonder, I, I do have a question about sure. that, about picking the right person, obviously the people you surround with your, yourself with are absolutely critical. Yeah. Would you recommend somebody that's close to you or maybe somebody that's a complete stranger to speak with? Do you have any thoughts about that? In terms of a loved one or someone who actually wants to reach out to I someone? have a problem. Who do I talk to about it? Do I talk to my best friend? Sure, or, yeah. Or do I talk they, to somebody that's a stranger? Yeah, stranger? whoever they feel closest to. But I, I do think if they know that they have a problem, they want to reach out to a family member, the family member isn't necessarily going to judge them. They're your son, they're your brother, they're your auntie, they're your uncle. They, they, they understand and they want you to get the best help that you need. Mind you, if someone feels more comfortable to their, to their extended friend or one of their best friends that they can actually reach out to, more often than not, that best friend would call me, Ben, my, okay. my best friend has a problem, we don't want to go to the family yet. Can you talk to him? Can you have a conversation with him? Can you work with him and slowly be able to intertwine it into the family dynamic? And that's what I do really well is to get the family members on side so the loved one doesn't just walk in and feel sabotaged. Oh my God, it's intervention. I don't want to do this and run away and feel lesser than. Interesting. Ben, thank you so much. It's thank amazing so much. the work that not only you're doing in a community, but you've lived it. So you really, there's no excuse. Nobody can ever say that, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Unfortunately, you do. Yeah. Unfortunately but, or fortunately. And I just want to finish well, that. Yes. I, I, my, my wife, Paula Morley, who has been through it all, who a wife that maintains total sobriety, who isn't an addict alcoholic, but she maintains it just to support me in my daily life and my business and, and come on board and do this together. I'm eternally grateful and um, she's really uh, reached out and had been one of the main reasons why I do what I do. So I'm really grateful for that. Ben, thank you so much. And everybody that's watching, if you do have an issue, we'll have links in the, in the show notes. Just contact us. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you so much. I love what you do.